नमस्तस्मे भगवते हते सम्यक संबुद्धा नमस्तस्मे भगवते हते सम्यक संबुद्धा नमस्तस्मे भगवते हते सम्यक संबुद्धा वेलकम ऑल एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग आई रियली अप्रिशिएट इट बिकॉज दिस न्यू वेबसाइट इज for you meaning for anyone who has some level of interest in sanskrit and buddhism and especially it is for those who wish to study and practice buddhism through the medium of sanskrit whether mainly through the medium of sanskrit or as a kind of complement to whatever else they might be doing so we have had activities in the past of various types mostly through uh, our facebook uh, instagram and youtube but we only today have something new which is a website and this has been uh, uh, something we worked on for about two years in fact i should say that uh, the idea of uh, making this website was exactly two years ago from the perspective of the lunar calendar, which is two years ago, Sagadawa. In fact, happy Sagadawa to those of you who know what it is. And uh, even to those of you who don't know what it is, happy Sagadawa. I hope you may have a good Sagadawa. The website is in my opinion a bit more stable and uh, maybe more useful for, for those who want to use text for those who want to find texts easily and um, of course it's also accessible to those who may not be able to access facebook for example or may not want to. we will still use facebook to advertise mostly what is on the website as also if we have any events just like uh, today's event and uh, instagram for the same purpose but the bulk of the activities of salgatam is going to shift to the website which now is um not very large as you will soon see but today i can introduce it so as to give you an idea of what you can expect from it and uh, which type of texts are going to be there um, and uh, how we are going to enrich it in future and also to hear your feedback about it. So let me just start by introducing the website. Now I will share it on my screen. I hope you can all see it well. So this is our website saugatam.org this is the website address and uh, as you can see this is our logo just like you can find on the facebook page as well as on the youtube channel this is the letter a in dungeon script and this is the word saugatam in the same script uh, it is somewhat a decorative ceremonial script and therefore we used it for the logo so as you can see there are only a few pages uh, in the website and i will go through each of them briefly just to give you an idea of uh, what is there <laughs> and maybe to explain um, some of the content or by adding something and later uh, if you want uh, if you have something more you want to know about the various parts i will listen to your questions and hopefully i'll be able to answer some of them so this is the home page and uh, one can always return to the home page by pressing on the word saugatam so if you go to let's say to about then if you want to go back to the home page you just press again saugatam and this initial screen will come back so let's start from about 
so that you may know a little bit what Salgatam is about and why we have this website, what is the, the whole point. Uh, we start with Triratnaya Namaha, which is an obeisance, an act of homage to the three jewels. As it is customary in the Buddhist tradition, we always start by praising the three jewels in some form. In brief, Saugatam promotes the study and practice of Buddhism in Sanskrit. This is very concisely what we want to do. We want to offer materials that will allow people to uh, feel that what they have is reliable enough for them to study and practice Buddhism in this language. And uh, I can explain that this comes from my own experience because uh, this is what I have been doing and in my life I found it uh, to be somewhat a challenge to find these materials. At the same time I observed that such materials exist abundantly for Sanskrit when it comes to non-Buddhist traditions. For example, when I was a BN May student in South India, I used quite a bit these uh, publications by the Ramakrishna Math, these uh, texts like the Sankhya Karika or the Niti Shataka, which were offered with good explanations, a little bit of grammar with some reliable text. And this for me was really helpful when I wanted to understand those systems. But I did not find anything similar when it came to the Buddhist texts. Similarly, when I wanted to chant in Pali, I found a very, very nice booklet in Malaysia, um, in the main uh, Mahavihara from the Sri Lankan tradition. There was a very nice booklet, which is still being sold, where all the daily chants in Pali were collected in a nice way. And anyone like myself who had some uh, aspiration to find something good to chant on a daily basis could use that booklet. Again, I could not find anything similar in Sanskrit for a long time. I did find it later thanks to the Vyoma Kusuma Sangha who has a Prarthana Pustika and that is very nice. It is a little bit geared towards those who practice through Nepali though, so perhaps there is still something that could be done for those who do not go through that language. And uh, all of this gave me the inspiration to try to create such materials. Also because the materials that are available in my experience at least are either not entirely reliable in terms of how the text is presented or the, the text is very reliable, but somehow difficult to access for people who are not specialists. So we are trying to fill in this gap, wherein even somebody who is not a Sanskrit specialist, even someone who's a complete beginner, may have something to start with, may have something just to chant, even if they do not want to become experts in Sanskrit. So one of the points that I make in uh, this introduction is that uh, we do not wish to represent a very specific school or a very specific mode of practice, but rather we want to be as inclusive as possible because Sanskrit is connected to, we could say, all the modes of practice that exist even to this day in the Buddhist tradition. So, in Sanskrit, there will be something for any kind of Buddhist practice that one might like to engage in. It's not going to be, for example, as some might presume, exclusively Mahayana materials. And I will show you an example of that very soon. One um, feature of uh, this project, something that um, we emphasize 
and uh, I like to repeat this very often and forgive me if you heard it many times. Oh, it's chanting. I feel that chanting is very important and one of the purposes of this website is to offer texts, even if they're very short, even if they're very simple, but texts which can be chanted by people who want to practice Buddhism. There's numerous advantages in chanting and it is a very traditional, almost universal practice within the Buddhist tradition. You can see it in all the traditions. So this is something that personally I would much recommend, but at least uh, we want to offer the materials for people to be able to do that in Sanskrit. In fact, we already have certain groups for uh, online group chanting. If you're interested, I will show you uh, how you may contact the relevant uh, friends who organize this. And if in turn, you may be interested yourself to organize some such group, you can tell us and we can help you by offering some suggestions, materials, and even advertising the activity uh, of your chanting group. Now, there are many people that we are grateful to, and I would like to mention here at least two. The first one is the late Padma Shri, Professor Ram Shankar Tripathi, my late teacher, who is a good example of somebody who practiced, studied and practiced Buddhism through Sanskrit. His main teacher was His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and uh, Tripathi Guruji did all his practices in Sanskrit. And he did many of them. I'm not now going to say what he did, but he did practice Buddhism through Sanskrit for a lifetime and he made an enormous effort to revive this tradition of Buddhism in Sanskrit. So this is the first person that I think we owe a debt of gratitude to. And then Guru Vagindra Shila Dhaja, which is the translation of Lama Ngawan Sultan Gyaltsen, who is in Nepal. And uh, he is, of course, known to be a retreatant and a retreat master, but he's also a grammarian, an editor, and something that not many know, he studied quite a bit of Sanskrit. Something in common to both of them is that they are known sectarian and uh, Tripathi Guruji used to be very explicit about this, that he was completely non-sectarian, non not affiliated to any particular school. And uh, uh, Lama Tsungela comes from a tradition of non-sectarian masters. As he comes from Tukten Chirling, which is kept to Tuzhi Rinpoche's Gumpa. And uh, Tuzhi Rinpoche also held so many different lineages. And they encouraged me as well to adopt a similar attitude. And uh, I think that this fits very well with uh, studying and practicing Buddhism in Sanskrit. As for the term Saugatam, it comes from the word Sugata, which is one of the main uh, terms referring to a Buddha. And Saugata means used <coughs> to the Sugata, so it can refer also to the teachings. Uh, if we use it in a different way, it can also refer to a person who is a follower, follower of the uh, Okay. Uh, I must thank Kienze Foundation because they offer their support, financial support for this project. The project is still very small. Um, but we hope that uh, we will be able to grow and offer more. So this is just okay. to expand a little bit on what you will find in the About page. Now to go to what is perhaps the main part here, the text. 
Now, at the moment, we have three categories of texts, and uh, we just have a few texts which uh, may exemplify to you these three categories. The first type is text in Sanskrit only, and these are meant primarily just for those who wish to chant. For one reason or another, they might be already familiar with the existence of a certain text, and they might be looking for a reliable version of the text to chant. And this is what we are trying to provide. Uh, when we upload this text, we try to check them. More than one person checks them. And let me offer you the first example. This is the Arya Manjushri Nama Sangitihi and the short version, Sanchipta Matrika, by which I mean the version that corresponds to what is normally chanted in the Tibetan tradition, without the somewhat lengthy prose passages which tell the advantages of chanting the Manushrinam Sangiti itself. And uh, uh, let me just show you, so you will see also an example of the format. When you click, the PDF comes up. All the PDFs will be more or less in the same format. First, there is the title, then we, um, we mention who is the editor, who has done the input, the author, etc. And we also mention which edition it is, because the idea is that it's possible, it's quite likely actually, that we make uh, mistakes. And uh, if somebody points them out, or if we ourselves are able to catch that there are some mistakes or something should be improved, we can collect them and after a few months come up with an updated revised edition so that the text hopefully becomes better and better. For this text, uh, well, it is based on published editions, not on manuscripts, but I think I can say that there are certain improvements compared to the available published editions. And one reason that I feel confident about it is because Professor Harunaga Isaacson kindly checked it and offered some advice as well. He seemed to agree with the small emendations here and there that we proposed, and he suggested some other corrections which were very useful. And since I have infinite trust in his judgment, I feel that this text now is already somewhat an improvement compared to anything else you may be able to find um, if you wish to chant the Manjushri Nama Sangeet. This text uh, appears first in Devanagari, and later there is the Roman script text. And well, first there is an introduction. The introduction gives you some very basic information about what the text is about. And then you will find some notes, very, very simple notes. This is not really a critical apparatus, but it's meant to offer you sufficient information that you will feel confident that the version that you're reading is based on something reliable. And uh, the few changes we made were well-reasoned and plausible. So this is the purpose of these few notes. And then we have the references, which again are meant to offer you uh, the basic information to have some sense of uh, confidence that we didn't just invent this text. Uh, the Manjushri Nama Sangeeti is to some extent an exception to a general rule for uh, the website. The general rule being that we do not really provide much in the way of uh, uh, mantranaya or tantric materials. The Manjushri Nama Sangeeti is somewhat an exception because it is often chanted just as a praise of Manjushri even though it is also regarded as being a tantra. So there are a few exceptions like that, which are posted only after consulting with uh, qualified teachers with 
the tradition, within the tradition, and this is out of respect for the traditional attitude towards uh, Tantra. And uh, that is also one reason why there's not much explanation here and no translation. Now, the second category, which is perhaps the, the one which may interest the most, the larger public, is texts with some amount of explanation. And let me offer you one example among these three, the first one. The praise to the three jewels, Tirat Namaskriya Shlokaha, just one verse, which you can also find as uh, several of the texts that are going to be published here, recorded and uploaded on our YouTube channel. So you can also use the YouTube channel if you want to have some idea of how to chant. Now this text, again, the, the basic structure of the PDF is going to be the same. There's going to be an introduction, which offers very basic information. <laughs> Uh, yes, somewhere is on the phone. This praise is praise of the three jewels, and uh, I explain in brief the characteristics of this praise. Uh, then we have the actual text in uh, and Roman script. Okay, wait. Maybe I should mute everyone for a moment. Let me mute everyone except myself because otherwise we hear this phone call. But here there is a translation, so this is one of the differences between these two categories of texts, and then there is some grammatical explanation. The grammatical explanation is very basic, extremely basic. We have the Padacheda, and then a glossary, which explains also which Vibhakti it is, and sometimes adds a little bit of grammatical information or information about that term, etc. And this, I feel, is not only for those people who really want to learn Sanskrit deeply, but also for those who may be interested to know what does this particular term mean more precisely? Why does it appear in this way? so that once again one gains more confidence in what one is chanting or what one is reading and again at last we have the references so these texts all are going to work in this manner the third category of text is books uh, which i think mostly will be didactic books and uh, this book again is similarly organized but you will see that there is something different this is a manual so here we have philosophical text the 30 verses this is a chittamatra text a mind only text by asubandhu and uh, the text here is presented in a way so as to be um, more easily accessed so uh, it is presented first as uh, text and translation then there are some explanatory notes and the explanatory notes are based on a sanskrit commentary by stiramati so someone might ask well why not just translate stiramati's commentary well the reason is that well, although that would be excellent it's a great idea it has been done maybe the available translations can be improved a bit it has been done but sometimes reading a commentary the translation of a commentary is almost as difficult as reading it in a language that one doesn't know because the result of translating a commentary is that we still have a text with 
are a lot of scholastic conventions. And someone who's not familiar with those conventions might, might find it very difficult to follow what is happening. And therefore, in, uh, in my experience, sometimes for beginners, it might be easier if one rather um, uses some kind of uh, paraphrase of the contents of the commentary, and one also selects the parts which are a little bit less challenging and more suitable for beginners. And this is what is being done in this text. Uh, this text has been used for teaching already uh, in IBC, as well as in Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And in fact, for this text, I really owe an infinite debt of gratitude to Lauren Bausch, Professor Lauren Bausch, who has uh, improved it in a number of different ways and also offered me general feedback about whether the students found it usable or not and her experience teaching. So um, I feel that this can be used as a didactic text. I have used it, I think, with profit. And um, I would encourage you to try if you happen to be lecturers and you are teaching a yoga chara course. One of the purposes of creating this text was a very practical one for me, which is when I find myself teaching courses, like let's say on general yoga chara, I still want to have them anchored to a, an authoritative text. And sometimes I need to fill in the gaps by writing notes and making it accessible to the students and make those notes also into a kind of overview of the system. I feel that the 30 verses are a good overview of the yoga system. And in that sense, this at least fulfills my aims when I want to teach a course on yoga art. But apart from those who are in a university setting, if you're curious about what is the mind only school, uh, what are its tenets, its understanding of how the mind works, I hope that you will find this text, although still a bit challenging, but not entirely impossible to read. So these are the various types of texts, and uh, perhaps we will have other categories in future responding to your own requests and suggestions. Now, news and events is now not a particularly uh, long list. Uh, it only lists the weekly Sangiti, which is going on. And uh, if you click on this, it gives you a little bit more information of how to join the Sangiti, if you so wish. But we will add other events and I hope that in future, when things become a little bit better, some of the events will be in person, not only online events. Now, we have a long list of people, and uh, <laughs> I would like to say something briefly about all of them. I will try to do that, although I see that I already exhausted my allotted time. Uh, I can say very good things about all of them and of course you might think this is because I want to advertise the website but it's not just for that I am really convinced of it of course Aulama Gelung Sultan Gelsen is my teacher so maybe if you are curious you can look on some search engine and you will find more information I have briefly mentioned uh, also, we can say where he learned, what his lineages are, which is his very known sectarian. And uh, what I have to add compared to what you will find online is that, yes, he also studied Sanskrit. In fact, he taught me quite a bit in Sanskrit, which I found rather amazing. Aileen Chong is a wonderful filmmaker, and we have an idea to have a collaboration with her. So far it hasn't materialized, but we had some delays. In fact, the website was supposed to start earlier, but we just started. So we hope that this can happen. If you like short and non-fiction, 
I would strongly recommend her short movies. Dr. Andreas Doctor is a friend, a great scholar, and he's in charge of uh, edit uh, as chief editor of 84,000. So he has a lot of experience there, which translates into very good advice for us. Dr. Giuliano Giustarini, again, friend, great scholar, especially in the Pali tradition, and he can offer us a lot of advice when it comes to those sutras, those texts, which are Sanskrit texts, not from the Mahayana tradition, and which have Pali parallels. Professor Harunaga Isaacson, uh, well, what to say? Mm, uh, very hard to say uh, much about Haru because he's kind of a living legend and uh, his Sanskrit is uh, stellar. Um, and he has been extremely kind. You will see that in the texts that are already here, he has already offered a lot of advice and this has allowed us to improve these texts. And generally is a great inspiration to improve one's Sanskrit for anyone who uh, is learning Sanskrit, if you can have the opportunity to watch even a video of uh, Professor Isaacson explaining something, this will probably, for most people, it will give some kind of idea that, okay, I have to improve my Sanskrit. I think most people have this experience. I certainly do, at least. Mats Katri is a filmmaker and is going to help us in that area. Um, because we want to improve the quality of our video material. We probably need to do that. We want to keep things simple, but at the same time, if we can make them more elegant and easier to enjoy, then of course we are happy to do that. Kienze B is a friend who offers very good advice on how to um, make this more accessible to a wider public and also to a younger public of course, we're very keen to do that. We, it's very important that there is a younger generation of people who has interest in uh, Buddhism in general and in Sanskrit. Minet Mangahas has offered also very good advice regarding the website. And one of the things that she suggested is that we should try to make it accessible also to people who are visually impaired. And I hope we can succeed in doing that although I do not yet know the technicalities of it. Belva Naik is a Drupad singer and my vocal music teacher. And since we have such an emphasis on chanting, I try to take as much advice from her as possible. Uh, she has not only great abilities as a singer, uh, you can see her videos She's uh, from one of the most refined schools of uh, traditional Indian singing that exist, but also she is a person with a great vision and she's very open and so she can offer advice even when we want to refine the way Buddhist Sanskrit texts are being chanted. Sorry, I see something. Oh, yes, I, yes, I will um, write the address. Um, I will write the address in the chat. Wait, somebody asked for the address. So let me write it. Oh, I, I should send it to everyone, sorry. I hope you will receive it now. Okay. Uh, Junya uh, is someone extremely talented with languages. He is now doing a PhD covered in three different languages, Latin, Classical Chinese, and Sanskrit. And so I hope he can be of help to us by offering something in a comparative light, which I think would be um, something new and hopefully very interesting. Uh, Dr. Alex Ruiz Falkes, another great Pali scholar who is also strong in Sanskrit and can help us, especially because I have this plan to write some 
commentaries on some of the sutras based on what is available in Pali but also in Burmese and they can give some idea or we can discuss and find what would be the best way to offer something in Sanskrit that uh, takes some inspiration from the Theravada tradition as well. Dr. Greg Seton is an expert in the Abhisamaya Lankara literature, the commentary literature on the Pratnya Paramita, especially Ratnakara Shanti. And uh, again, uh, he has familiarity with both Tibetan and Sanskrit, and this is quite important because sometimes when we want to uh, clarify the meaning of a Sanskrit word or even understand what would be the best reading for a Sanskrit text looking at Tibetan is so useful. Girivirya Sulaiman will offer us advice especially regarding how to reach out to the Indonesian friends. Uh, and this is uh, very important, I think, because the, the in Indonesia is really one of, if not the place for Buddhist Sanskrit in antiquity, but definitely one of them. Uh, Prashan, Prashan Varma from Deer Park will help us especially to know what could be useful for our friends uh, in India. And he has a lot of experience thanks to Deer Park and uh, his suggestions can be very useful in that area. The main contributors are Vidya Devi, so it should be here, and uh, she has been extremely active. She translated uh, the Facebook page into Spanish. We have a Spanish Facebook page. She helps a lot with uh, Sangeeti, so she's one of the persons that you should contact if you would like to have this online chanting. Uh, and she also helps a lot with Instagram. And of course, I hope that she can help more and more with different aspects of Saugata. Vaidya Somananda Dharmanata is the best Buddhist doctor I know. Uh, and uh, of course, he has many other qualifications. Uh, meditation teacher, he knows uh, Thai traditional uh, yoga and many other things. So his advice can be on a variety of things. And I hope especially that we can have a series of events with him connected, let's say to Baishadja Guru or to the Baishadja Vastu, things which are connected to medicine, meditative practice, texts which are connected to traditional uh, medicine. Or like, for example, the Ashtanga Hridaya, which is also important in the Tibetan tradition. Hang Mengyun, is someone to whom we owe a lot, especially whatever elegance or beauty you see in the website or elsewhere, it's thanks to her. She's a very talented artist and she has an interest in both Buddhism and Sanskrit. So I think she helped us to achieve look. Uh, this is at least what we aspire towards, which is simple, uh, easy to access, but elegant. So this is our hope. Dibek Prasad Sharma, I just saw a typo, sorry Dibek, I will correct it. Um, he is a great scholar in classical Chinese and Sanskrit and also it's Pali. And so this connection between uh, classical Chinese and Sanskrit is also another very important area that uh, we wish to work in. We want to uh, translate everything into Chinese as well. And uh, we want to offer sometimes comparative texts where both the Sanskrit text and the Chinese text is available. And Bibe can definitely help us a lot with that and also with many other areas. Dr. Maria Vasilieva can do something similar for Tibetan because she's a very accomplished Tibetanist. She knows Sanskrit well too. And I think her Sanskrit is improving by the hour because she's so talented. And also she has helped in many cases just catching many of my mistakes because I make many mistakes every time I write a sentence. And unless several people reread what I write, it's going to be a disaster. Huang Yecheng 
He's going to help us translate the Chinese. Young, very talented scholar, and uh, um, also devoted to the Buddhist tradition. We have gone to pilgrimages together in uh, different parts of China, and it was really a pleasure. Very, very efficient person. Uh, I look forward to have more materials in Chinese. Usha Laguna, Richard Budianta, is doing a very good job with the Indonesian side. We have an Indonesian uh, Facebook page, which uh, if you are Indonesian, I would invite you to check. And we hope really that uh, more of the Indonesian friends are going to notice it and make use of it. And hopefully eventually this too, this website could be translated into Indonesian. Birya Shri, Marco is doing a great job with the Italian part of the um, Facebook. So he, he takes care of the Italian Facebook page and also of the uh, Sangiti in part. And so he's the other person that you might want to contact if um, you would like to organize some Sangiti. And then lastly, there is me and they just coordinate things a little bit. Then we have the links. This is the YouTube page, all the different Facebook pages, and I have not yet uh, put the Instagram, but I will. And if you want to contact us, these are our contacts, and you can just offer feedback or make requests for either, I don't know, a specific text, or if you want some event, you can ask us what kind of event you would like. We will try to uh, offer what you ask and also if you catch some mistakes please tell us because we we have this advantage that uh, uh, the texts are here online and we can always improve upon them and so if you read and you find okay look there is a typo I just found one today <laughs> fortunately the big name I wrote it wrongly um, but this happens so we are keen to make things more and more reliable and minimize the mistakes so as to make things more and more usable by you. So I've taken somewhat longer than I had expected and I apologize for that. I also apologize for mistakes that you might have already found in the website. And uh, now I would like to uh, offer you some time if you want to ask some questions I can try my best to answer them so if you want to ask questions you could do it in two different ways one is on the chat if you prefer to write otherwise you can unmute yourself and just speak out and ask a question either way is perfectly fine Show me example. Yes, yes, please. Uh, I see you raised your hand. So if you want, you can uh, unmute yourself and you can speak. Can you unmute yourself? Oh. Let me see. Uh, okay, wait. It seems that I have to do something else before he can unmute himself. Okay, I see a question. Are you going to have audio recordings on the website? I'm not yet certain of that. Uh, because at present the audio recordings are available on the YouTube channel. So I'm uncertain as to whether I will add some audio recordings to the website itself. Maybe, maybe. But we will see how it looks, for example, or how uh, how it, uh, whether it is really the most practical thing to do or whether it is better to keep the 
the recordings elsewhere, maybe indicating sometimes that a specific recording is available there. Uh, actually, um, I think, Chogel, you should be able to unmute yourself. I just checked the settings. Um, what happened to Chogel who raised his hand? Maybe he raised his hand. Ben. Hello? Yes. Okay. So, sorry, it was just a mistake. Ah, okay. Okay, no problem. Hello, greetings, Mafia. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I arrived a little late because I had a little problem with my own poetry site, my Dharma poetry site. I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I could not um, unblock my video. <laughs> it's all oh. right. As long as I see you, it's all right. Thank you for coming. Sure, I'm sorry I missed out on it, you know. I forgot about it, actually, until I saw your, you know, I, until I scrolled back and I checked on the date and, oh, my goodness, it's tonight. <laughs> I should have arrived earlier. I'm sorry. No problem. Anyway, all best wishes to the site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Sasha has a question. What are the steps in preparation of an edition of a Sanskrit text? How one can explain the significant variations in the final edition? And what are the ways to deal with and understand these variations? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. That's a very big question. Well, um, I would say that uh, rather than answering directly, my suggestion would be that if you're already reading Sanskrit texts, try to read the apparatus. And the apparatus will show you a little bit the variance together with some indication of why a certain choice has been made. So by starting to read that, you will gain experience and understand uh, more clearly why a certain choice has been made. There are ways to explain it different ways to explain it, but I feel it would be a bit abstract. I think the best thing is to look at the text, look at how it has been constituted, and then uh, see the apparatus and uh, try to make sense of what's going on there. And slowly, this becomes a little bit easier to understand. This would be my suggestion. Not a question, but thank you to all involved with Okay, very good. Will be Will be there only existing editions of the Sanskrit text or also back translations? Also back translations. There will also be back translations. Uh, when, when it feels like it is really worth uh, offering a back translation and or when the back translation uh, can be considered to be reasonable in terms of uh, being reliable. Mm, this is a point that um, is not entirely easy to explain, but not all the texts are equally easy or equally difficult to back translate. And now I'm thinking from the Tibetan, from the Chinese, I cannot say anything, but from the Tibetan, some texts I feel that we can back translate with a good degree of uh, certainty. And in those cases, it's not so different from making an addition. It's not so different. Because in some cases, we are quite certain that that is exactly the expression that was there, almost certainly, since there are certain stock expressions or expressions which appear with well-attested parallels elsewhere. So those are easier. Other texts are much more challenging to back translate. And in that case, I think it is better to wait. In general, I will try to um, emphasize, start more from texts which already exist in Sanskrit for the simple reason that these are already a lot. There are so many thousands and thousands of pages of Buddhist texts in Sanskrit, many of which nobody reads. So if we can start by making those texts already more available and uh, raising awareness that these texts exist as, and that these texts can also be a basis for practice, for example, I think this is already uh, quite a good start. 
And of course, ideally, if, if we can grow enough and we can put enough time and effort into this, I would be very glad to organize a kind of as complete as possible collection of Buddhist texts in Sanskrit, especially for the Buddha Vajana. So this we have to see according to how the people who use the website respond and how much time we can put into it. Okay. Um, other questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, um, congratulations for, for this project. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about, uh, will you offer a resource for, for prosody, for, for metrical uh, analysis, or, or just to teach a little bit on, on the usage of, of meters for, for the chanting? Yes. Um, yes, I think I will. I was thinking about it, actually, uh, which cases. I'm, my idea is to do that when there is a verse which is particularly poetic and uh, where the meter becomes very important and then it is really worth trying to explain what the meter is and uh, also give some hints on how to chant it. Generally, my overall advice would be that if someone makes a sustained effort to distinguish between short versus long vowels and paces one's chant accordingly, that itself will suffice to bring out the meter almost naturally. So just this mindfulness of long versus short, even at the cost of exaggerating the length of the long vowels in the beginning because my experience has been that for those who are not used to this distinction um, pronouncing long vowels feels a little bit awkward and therefore the tendency is not to really lengthen enough so in that case it is better to overdo it a little bit in the beginning and then this distinction becomes very well ingrained in one's mind and in one's voice and automatically some of the meter comes out if we just are able to follow that basic distinction. I asked once, regarding melodies, there is a certain amount of freedom. Um, I asked that once to one of my teachers at uh, Vivekananda College, Professor Srinivasan was a very great Sanskritist and he told me, well, you can kind of make up your own melody to some extent, as long as you respect the meter. So that was the main emphasis. You have to respect the meter, but, and you can see that the same exact meter can be chanted in thousands of different ways. Even if you compare the South India and North India, the most popular ways of chanting, even the most popular meters are going to be quite a bit different. And then of course, there are many more regional variations, etc. And people come up with new melodies all the time. Uh, but the main point is to follow the distinction between long and short vowels, I think, because that in turn determines whether the syllables are guru or laghu, and this is going to determine how the meter is going to go. So that is just a very basic advice. But beyond that, yes, um, there are some texts which are expressly meant to teach meter. I, my thinking would be to include more of the verses from the Vrittamala Studi, of Jnana Shri Mitra, because in that case we have verses of praise of Manjushri, which at the same time exemplify a certain type of meter, and they're very beautiful verses. 
all containing the very name of the verse, or sorry, the very name of the meter that is being exemplified. So they're really very nice verses to chant, and I think very good to learn a little bit about meter. Okay, in the chat, are you going to add general notes on Sanskrit grammar? Yes. Yes, good question. Thank you, Giuliano. Um, yes, I have a plan to do so. In fact, when I was mentioning that there may be further categories of uh, text, one of the categories I was thinking is in fact notes on Sanskrit grammar. And these notes should complement the grammar, which is a work in progress and I hope will be published within one year or so. So, yes, um, this is, uh, is one of the ideas. Um, I have not done it yet, partly because I want to reflect a bit more on how to teach it, since I would like it to be as accessible as possible. Uh, and maintaining the two features that I always like to emphasize while teaching Sanskrit grammar, which is using traditional Sanskrit grammatical categories and emphasizing Buddhist examples. So in other words, gear, whichever notes on grammar are going to be offered towards reading Buddhist texts. Question number two, do you already know which text is going to be added next? Well, there's a series of three texts which uh, have already been also checked by Lauren very kindly and uh, once I'm able to fix the mistakes that she pointed out and uh, decide on some uh, suggestions then I will also ask one more person to check so that or and then uh, maybe this will be these are going to be uh, uploaded uh, the, the aim would be to upload, let's say, two, three, four texts each month, depending on how long they are. So some short texts, occasion, occasionally something longer, hopefully, and maybe once a year book length publication. This is more or less the idea. And we will see. Uh, it depends also uh, how many other people do some text input, etc. But this is more or less the idea. Are there any plans to offer the advanced course currently run by Mangala Research Center on the website YouTube? Well, uh, that would be awkward because they are using the material that I wrote. So, <laughs> if they're offering, so no, not exactly. They, we will offer something, but it will be more basic. Or we will offer some readings. Uh, now, Maybe something on the Abhidharma Kosha. Some people have asked to read some of Abhidharma Kosha, and so maybe it will be that. But it will also depend on uh, what people ask, because we can offer only when people ask for something. So maybe, yes, some, some readings online and something more for basic grammar. So Chogi Azampo was asking, do you have any manual and guidebook of Sanskrit grammar? Well, if you look on the, on the YouTube channel, you will find that there is a playlist uh, which contains a very introductory lessons, uh, 10 very introductory lessons. And um, those lessons are part of 20 lessons which have already been sending around. So one of the things I want to upload on the website next is a revised version of those 20 lessons, maybe adding a few, and this would be a very, very basic way to introduce Sanskrit grammar. But the longer, more formalized manual of Sanskrit grammar is meant to be published with Mangalam, and therefore I cannot upload it on the website. Links to Sanskrit dictionary. Oh, well, um, 
if you use um search engine i'm not going to say the name and you just write sanskrit dictionary uh there is one sanskrit dictionary which is literally called sanskrit dictionary which is i think very good because it puts together several different dictionaries and uh, it even offers some grammatical analysis in the sense that if you put um, a word such as a finite verb form like bhavati it will tell you what it is so that's quite good. Okay. Uh, I don't know any other questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. The one that I know is just uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask that, uh, uh, do you think that due to uh, the, these kind of projects like uh, Sogotam and other projects that we can hope that one day we might be able to recreate uh, on a very minor scale the Sanskrit tradition as a, as a Sangha, like a real living Sangha? Uh, perhaps not as it used to be in the past uh, during like the say Nalanda times, but do you think it might be possible to somehow reinitiate this tradition, uh, especially in India? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a, a difficult question. Mm, to do that, well, first of all, when people use the word Sangha in different ways, so I should First of all, clarify that personally, I use that term only to refer to the ordained Sangha. I know that in, in uh, modern parlance, we use the word Sangha just to mean my Sangha, meaning a group of people who follow the same teacher. But I think that actually is a modern English usage primarily. The, the term for that should be Parishat or Parivara, in my understanding. Uh, so if by Sangha, we really mean the ordained Sangha, um, I believe that there are some ordained monks that make use of Sanskrit to different degrees. So, but if we, if you mean, like for example, having, let's say, a whole monastery who wants to practice just in Sanskrit, well, it is possible, it is possible, but you know, this depends on people's interest. Uh, one would have to find someone who's ready to take up vows, become an upadhyaya, and ordain other people within one's own monastery where all the ceremonies are done in Sanskrit. So for that, I think the first step is in fact to provide the uh, basic textual material. This may seem uh, too simple, but in fact, that is a very basic step because if the, there is no clear cut collection of texts, let's say to recite the Prati Moksha, if there is no um, right, collection of text that includes how to take the Upasampada, uh, the rules of Vinaya, and then uh, text to study Abhidharma, texts which indicate how to do meditation. If there is no confidence that all of this is there in a reliable form and that there are people who can read them and understand them, then the very idea of creating or having a Sangha in the sense of a Buddhist monastery where people uh, are doing all the ceremonies in Sanskrit becomes difficult. Um, if you're talking about lay people, of course, there are several people who practice exclusively in Sanskrit and they have access to whichever level of practice they want. That is a different story. But if you mean having the ordained Sangha, that depends on ordained people who take interest in the matter and uh, decide to go for it. 
in principle it's possible uh, but <laughs> in the present situation i think many would say that um, there's also a struggle to maintain the sanghas the ordained sanghas which already exist so i hope that it would help all the sanghas and i hope of course if it's going to be a sanskrit monastery that's going to be wonderful in a way they exist already which is the newer tradition but um, they're not as monastic uh, as one would think. Nevertheless, they are, uh, they are temples and they do all the ceremonies in Sanskrit. So in some sense it exists. And of course, there is the Sangha, the Vyoma Kusuma Sangha, where they do have some ordained members and we do have many lay people and they do all the main ceremonies in Sanskrit as far as I know and uh, it's a few hundred people is not so small so this is is not like it hasn't been done or there are no people practicing in sanskrit there are people practicing in sanskrit some people may advertise it more than others but um, yes on as as far as what happens on a large scale uh, personally i feel that it is we have to see what kind of interest is there and uh, my idea is to step by step offer usable reliable materials and then eventually offer so much material that if somebody wants they can do what you suggest so, so uh, it basically uh, comes down to uh, um, our ability uh, to uh, first recreate the uh, Sanskrit uh, Tripitaka or, or all these textual uh, uh, resources that you were talking about, whether for the chanting or the ceremonies or the Abhidharma and all of that. And perhaps we could recreate some, I know there are some efforts to recreate uh, from the Chinese. Oh, no, there's no need to recreate. You see, this is one point. The texts already exist. <laughs> this is one point. Most of the texts already exist. So that problem doesn't really exist in, in this sense. The no, I meant like the sutras that were not that are not extant anymore. Like the ones that were translated to Chinese, but they were lost uh, during the yes, burning that, of Nalanda. But that could be... Uh, second or third step in other words in terms of what already exists this is already more than sufficient to have a tradition of study and practice mm, even in uh, in the available tripitaka let's say in uh, tibetan some texts might be missing which are found elsewhere and this situation has been there at least since the time of vasubandhu and it's not a problem uh, the texts are so many that any given tradition is going to use only a fraction of those texts. This is bound to be so. And uh, the many, many pages of Sanskrit that we already have should suffice if somebody really wants to do that. But the difficulty is to train enough people who are able to actually read and explain those texts that is a different story. That is a bigger challenge because, um, unfortunately, mm, there is mixed interest in the sense that uh, I see interest more on the part of some individuals, but not really groups of people. And this, I think, uh, is hard to predict. It can go one way or the other. So I think the first step in my opinion is what one should make an effort to learn this text oneself well so that in future one will be able to explain them to others because when we have the texts the texts are great but if nobody can understand what the texts are saying then the tradition does not go very far the the idea is that there should be both Adigama and Agama. Agama is the transmission of the text. Adigama is the transmission of inner realization. So if there has to be 
a widespread Sanskrit tradition, there needs to be people who genuinely and assiduously do their practices in Sanskrit and they gain, they gain an understanding of the different levels of, of wisdom, of listening, of contemplation and meditation. Minimally, one should have a faithful way to represent these texts when explaining them. And this requires in itself a bit of effort. This is the same for all the languages, whichever language we want to study Buddhism in, if we want to study it well, we need to make a good amount of effort, find a source that we regard to be reliable. I personally believe in lineage, and this is just uh, my, I'm very traditionalist in that uh, respect, and therefore uh, try to find someone who has a lineage, learn from these people, and then try to develop in that way. And then, yes, it's possible. And then, uh, of course, the, if there's going to be a Sanskrit monastery, that's, that would be fantastic. I think that uh, would be great. Then I that keep uploading musicalized version on Vrittamala Studi. Thank you. I will try to do that. Yes, yes. That's a bit hit and miss. That is uh, my fault because there are some periods where I can get more music lessons. Then I feel more inspired to create some music. And other periods, I don't have that much leisure to get my music lessons and therefore uh, I don't get too much into creating new music. But I hope that site can also improve and uh, I can find some traditional musicians also to, um, to help. Uh, traditional musicians, I don't even mean necessarily only from the Indian tradition. There are a number of musical traditions which have musical instruments quite compatible with Sanskrit chanting, in my opinion, and I also like very much the ones in Southeast Asia, which, as I, as I was saying, um, I don't think, when I think of Sanskrit Buddhism, uh, earlier Sami was mentioned in Nalanda, and uh, the general idea is that Nalanda was the biggest place for Sanskrit Buddhism in ancient time. In fact, it was pointed out to me that this is not the case. The biggest place for Sanskrit Buddhism was in what is now Sumatra. So uh, Sanskrit Buddhism was very much beyond uh, India. It was, uh, there, there was a tradition of Sanskrit learning uh, even in China, there was a, a tradition of Sanskrit learning in Southeast Asia. There, there were traditions of Sanskrit learning in Central Asia. So it was really a very uh, widespread tradition and a kind of um, point, meeting point of many different Buddhist traditions. In fact, this is a feature I, I like to advertise about Sanskrit, that it's the only language which is somewhat connected to all the Buddhist traditions. There's no other language that has this feature. Okay, uh, I don't see other questions on the chat. Do you have other questions? I'm ordained in the Shingon tradition that uses Sanskrit heavily. Oh, my Lina chants Sans Heart Sutra in Sanskrit. Wonderful. We use Siddham. Do you know any resources for learning Siddham? Uh, a friend of mine would because he does Siddham calligraphy. There is the Siddham script somewhere on the internet. I was seeing it uh, recently. Learning a script generally is not very difficult. This is, um, uh, this is um, some, something I should mention, that we should not confuse learning Sanskrit with learning, let's say, Devanagari. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up Siddham. Um, 
In fact, it is very clear in the Sanskrit tradition that the language and the letters are the sounds. And uh, when we write them, that is meant to represent the sounds. And therefore, Sanskrit has been represented in hundreds of different scripts. Siddham being a particularly important one in the East Asian tradition. So um, one way could be, for example, for the Har Sutra, if I remember correctly, uh, there's a famous manuscript of the Har Sutra, the Siddham script, which is available maybe even online. And if you take that manuscript and you compare your version of the Hridaya Sutra with that manuscript, you might already be able to figure out a lot of Siddham script. This is actually how many people learn new scripts. They take a text which has already been edited, they look at the manuscript, and then by matching that, they become familiar with, the, with the, that script. This is about reading the script. However, when it comes to Siddham script, there is also the other aspect, which is, there's, as you know, better than I do since you, you are uh, ordaining the Shingon tradition, there is a whole tradition of Siddham calligraphy. And that is a different story. Uh, I think that uh, is learned usually from a master, but each and one of the people uh, in one of our contributors actually has studied it so i can ask him and uh, another friend actually studied it quite a bit bill mack he learned from a very good symptom specialist in japan and uh, he has studied symptom calligraphy for a while so for that i think that uh, online resources might not be sufficient if you want to learn how to do the calligraphy probably you need to go to somebody in person thank you thank you yes i see that uh, mariano has uh, uploaded a very useful link uh, josephine you raised your hand uh, uh, okay i'm very excited about your site um what is the first big project uh, that will involve your followers that you will have on your site? Big project? Well, the first big project, uh, in my uh, estimate of big projects, was uploading the Manjushri Nama Sangeeti in a revised edition. I know that maybe those are not many pages, so it doesn't look like we did much. But this text is so important, it's so profound. Uh, so even if we don't yet know the whole meaning of the text, etc., it's such a blessing to have such a text, even in a slightly improved version. So in my mind, in my way of uh, understanding big projects, that, that would be the first big project. If you mean something more like some event, yes, uh, then I don't know because, as I said, when it comes to event, it depends on what people ask. I am wary of offering something when it has not been asked for. So, depending on what people are going to ask, uh, we will go accordingly. So far, uh, a few people have asked to go through some parts of Abhidharma Kosha, so this could happen. And then Actually, I'm excited about that too. Will you be tackling all the seven baskets of Abhidharma? No, 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 it's something much smaller. Uh, we probably start from the Pudgala Vinishaya, which is uh, a part of Abhidharma Kosha, which is after the main eight chapter. Where in... The main what? Pardon, the main? Uh, it's a part of the Abhidharma Kosha, which is after the main eight chapters. So it's a ah, okay. supplement right. which focuses on the doctrine of selflessness. All so right. Perhaps this is where we will start. 
but I have to finalize this. It depends a little bit also from my teaching schedule. And All right. IDC. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I look thank forward you. to that. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, any other questions, suggestions, feedback? Anything you would like to say? Thank you. Okay, I don't see questions on the chat. Okay, may you please allow me something? Yeah, yeah please, please. Okay. I am just having problems setting up the site now, but I'm putting up a site for Dharma poetry and I welcome all uh, serious uh, Dharma students and practitioners to please, um, uh, I mean, you're all welcome to join and then write, uh, contribute poetry, uh, because I think there is a need to I have a site where people will improve their ability to write. And that's the goal. You know, there is, there is much knowledge, much, there's so much that, that a writer, a Dharma writer would like to express, but then the facility with language seems to be lacking and that's where we will come in. At the same time, we will have consultants like I have invited you to be a, one of the uh, editors to be one of the consultants so that we can check on the accuracy of the of the um, Dharma um, mentioned or the Dharma involved in the poetry. Thank you. Yes, that's very nice. I hope you all heard. So if you're interested, please do contact Josephine. And uh, I think that's a great project. And uh, I also wish you all success with it. Looking forward to seeing. I see. Thank you. Ji uh, Liang Ho has raised his hand. Uh, thank you, Professor Matia. First of all, thank you to you and your team. And just to kind of follow up what you said earlier, you say that um, if I, I'm not sure if I catch it correctly, you say something like um, Sanskrit has a, a longest, when you're talking about Sumatra. You said the longest uh, connection to oldest Buddhist tradition, something like that. That kind of relate to my question that I have. I missed your first part of the presentation. I'm not sure you've talked about this, which is what is the benefit of practicing in the uh, Sanskrit tradition that you see? Okay. Uh, for the first, for the Sumatra point, I was referring to Muaru Jambi, uh, which is uh, actually an archaeological site. There was a university there that was apparently much larger than Nalanda. And in fact, there was uh, probably Dharmakirti Shri, or sorry, probably we should call him Suvarna Dvipiya Dharmakirti, was the teacher of Atisha, Padampa Sanghi, and maybe Ratnakara Shanti, was probably from there. And we have one of his Sanskrit works, luckily, still surviving which is quite an amazing thing. So I was referring to that, that actually nowadays, what I have observed is that we live in a world of nations and therefore we associate specific languages to specific nations. So nowadays when people think of Sanskrit, we think India, but this idea of nation is relatively recent. And so is this con compartmentalization of languages. That was certainly not the case for the Buddhist tradition just a few hundred years ago. Now, as to what are the advantages of practicing in Sanskrit? That's a good question. Um, well, it depends on the person. What are the advantages of practicing in any language? It depends from the person. Some people have predispositions for a certain language. Some people have predispositions for another language. And I'm not going to argue that practicing in Sanskrit is better 
them, let's say, practicing in Tibetan, Chinese, or Pali, or any other Buddhist language. I would argue that generally, if one has some time, one should do at least some chanting in one Buddhist language. Any Buddhist language, but a Buddhist language, rather than English. And the reason is just because English doesn't yet have um, regularized terminology, regularized way of translation, and the way in which translation has been and is being done in English is so different from the way the Dharma was transmitted into other languages that I think it is still not a self-sufficient uh, system, let's put it this way. So I would suggest to do at least a little bit of chanting in another language. Now, which language it's going to be, I think depends on personal predispositions. I feel very comfortable with Sanskrit more than I do with other Buddhist languages. And therefore, I am glad to have the opportunity to do the practice in this language, which inspires me more and helps me to sustain my practice longer. So this is the advantage that I see as a Buddhist practitioner. If one is talking about study, it's different, then yes, then I could point to certain advantages of Sanskrit. At least I can make a comparison. If you want to read the Indian texts, it's a simple thing. When you read the text in its original language, it is usually easier and more comprehensible than in translation. It's quite simple. Uh, of course, this is just my word for it, but you can ask a number of people who have this experience of, re of reading the same text in Sanskrit and Tibetan, knowing both languages. And I'm talking about, of course, texts which were originally in Sanskrit. Then there are cases where uh, reading the original, I think in terms of study, has certain advantages. And uh, to some extent, the, the advantage is the commonality. So you can see that even among Tibetan masters who were non-sectarian, just not long ago, they made a big effort to learn and teach Sanskrit. Mipa Rinpoche wrote a Sanskrit dictionary. Jamyam Kienze Wampo wrote Sanskrit verses. Jamun Kondru Rinpoche used to teach Sanskrit Vyakarana. In many of the monasteries he went. So there is this idea of going back to something which is common ground, which I feel also is something, I don't know if the word advantage is the right word, but it's at least a benefit of looking into the Indian texts and into their originals. It depends also on which level of commitment one has to one's study and practice, how much time one has, you know, there's a lot. Uh, I'm just happy to hear a few Sanskrit syllables being recited. So, of course, for me, the advantage of using Sanskrit is very immediate. Some people, on the other hand, uh, are much more fascinated when they see a Chinese character, let's say. They get more out of that. For those people, maybe that's better. So this depends from person to person. My purpose is not to advertise Sanskrit as the best way to practice Buddhism. I would not claim that. But my purpose is for those people who have some interest, whether to practice only in Sanskrit or just to complement their practice with a bit of Sanskrit or their study with a bit of Sanskrit, I would like to help offering some resources that make it possible. That is my idea. I don't know, did, did it answer your question?
yeah, you, you did. Um, maybe just kind of follow, follow up question as a as a discussion. Right? So some people might might say, might ask, okay, since uh, the Pali tradition has been a long, uh, long as the tradition, and then and then the Sanskrit, uh, we might not have the uh, quote unquote the whole complete uh, version. So then, um, and one has to maybe, especially given these days, one has to go through rather kind of um, more, more, more kind of longer, longer route to, to, to get to learn and practice in Sanskrit tradition. Mm. So then what are your comments and, and thoughts on that? If one doesn't feel like making the effort, go for Pali. <laughs> no problem. Uh, but in terms of uh, availability, uh, having sufficient material to practice, I think it already exists. At least in my experience, it exists. In my teacher's experience, it exists. Uh, I have permission to do all my practices in Sanskrit. I never felt that I lacked anything. Um, no, never. Anything that I, in my wildest dreams, hope to obtain through Sanskrit, I got it. So I also think that uh, one must never underestimate one's aspirations. You might think that something is impossible. You just think, oh, this, but I think if somebody is very determined, then the conditions come about. This at least is my experience. It's something that I am very convinced of. So the point is, don't have much faith in aspiration or making an effort. Go for the easier thing, please. No problem. But if somebody on the other hand is a bit ambitious, maybe it's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But if somebody has this kind of aspiration, please, I would really like to do this practice in Sanskrit. My own experience is it happens. Sooner or later it happens. When the conditions are there, yes, that will come. So that's also why, um, how can I put it? This is just, we offer the basic. Then the person does their own, do their own practice. They can check what kind of benefit they have. And then their own life experience, in my opinion, will answer the question of whether they can find enough material or not. This has been at least my own experience, and this would be my suggestion. But I don't know if it was really well connected to your question. Yeah, you was. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Giuliano. Yes, and vice versa. Uh, Giuliano was saying that knowledge and reading Pali texts are improved by reading Sanskrit Buddhist texts. I think that is true, and vice versa is also good, in the sense that uh, when we learn Sanskrit, at some point reading some Pali is definitely going to help. Uh, for example, I was earlier saying that I want to get this inspiration from the Pali tradition. What I was referring to is the existence of the Attakata literature. So if you want to know, one of my long-term projects would be to write similar commentaries in Sanskrit for those sutras which are parallel to the Pali texts because the Attakata literature is invaluable. Very often it really uh, helps even while we read some Sanskrit to see what is being said in Pali. We should also understand this point. Sanskrit and Pali are not really, I think, two different languages. This might come as a surprise, but uh, I'll explain what I mean. We say that we have two different languages when, two, when speakers of those two languages cannot understand each other if, if they speak to each other. And this is not the case for Pali and Sanskrit. They are mutually comprehensible. Therefore, you could understand it more like 
different registers of the same language. Sanskrit also has different registers. There's a spectrum of Sanskrit uh, with different levels of um, regularization according to Panini's grammar, uh, with uh, slightly different vocabularies according to uh, communities, like philosophical communities, religious communities, etc. It's very rich. Ah, in fact, let me add one small advantage when we study in Sanskrit, which to me is an advantage. At least I found it useful. The fact that one can access non-Buddhist Indian philosophy, the fact that one can read the main opponents of the Buddhist philosophers. This is something that uh, my teacher, Professor Ram Shankar Tripathi, was saying that whichever philosophical system in India we want to understand, if we want to understand it well, we also have to know their opponents. Because a lot of what they say in their own texts is geared towards certain opponents, and we don't understand the argument well if we do not know what the opponents are saying. And this is something that uh, I find really, to me, was extremely useful, to me personally. Like the way I studied just uh, my own life, that was very useful. In fact, that's how my teacher, uh, Professor Ramchandra Tripathi, became a Buddhist because he was studying non-Buddhist texts and in those texts there were the Buddhist positions presented as opponent positions but after a while he started feeling that these counter arguments by the Buddhists are actually better than the main argument so he became curious and started trying to study more and more and that's how his interest grew and grew through the years so there is this aspect of debate with the other positions which is actually a very beautiful part of the buddhist tradition and the debate is not something negative or done with a negative mind at least that's not the impression i get when reading the text and this is not what the buddhist masters say when they explain how to do a debate and this is actually something that can greatly enrich one's understanding of a Buddhist position. And the example that I like to make is uh, it's taken from Alankara Shastra, another advantage. One can learn other branches of knowledge which are not purely philosophical but help with the philosophy. So there is this example uh, given by Dandin of two ways in which one can explain the greatness of a hero. If one writes a poem about a hero, one can do two things. Let's say we want to talk about the story of Rama. We can use one method, which is we start from the beginning by saying how great is Rama. That Rama was such an amazing person. He had this and this and this quality. Then he did this, then he did that. Or oh, even killed Ravana. One possibility. Second possibility. We don't talk about Rama. We talk about Ravana, his enemy. And we show that Ravana was an amazing person. Extremely skilled, extremely strong, the strongest person ever. Nobody could beat him. Then all we have to say is, and Rama beat him. We don't have to make a, to say much about Rama's qualities. We will understand the greatness of Rama, maybe even more effectively in that manner. So similarly, when we hear this view of selflessness, if we have an idea of how great and refined and noble the view of self can be, and then we learn that the Buddhist position even goes beyond that, then the view of selflessness gains in depth. That is one advantage in uh, learning Sanskrit. And another advantage is we learn to distinguish Buddhist and non-Buddhist positions, which I found actually 
uh, for many in the modern times is not very easy. There are many Buddhists when they hear Advaita Vedanta, they cannot distinguish that from Buddhism, which is interesting. And actually, it's also a kind of uh, reminder that uh, the view can go astray very easily. Maitripa makes this point when he describes the meditations of different types of Buddhists. He shows, if here you make this mistake, then your view is going to stray in this non-Buddhist philosophical view. If you make these mistakes, it will stray in this one. So actually, uh, learning this, uh, this very noble and profound non-Buddhist philosophies enriches one's understanding of how extraordinarily deep Buddhist thought is. So this is another advantage. Okay. Uh, Josephine, I see that your hand is raised. I do not know whether it is raised from earlier on or whether you would like to add something. I'm sorry, I I was not able to erase that. I don't know how to. Okay. Anyway, um, but um, suffice it to say that I am very happy about your uh, website, your new site. And there is much to learn from it. And any serious Buddhist um, scholar or Buddhist uh, practitioner should be uh, very happy to have such a site, especially from a very erudite and scholarly um, man such as you. Thank you. That is very kind. Uh, well, I think we, we do have a good team. I'm very happy with all the friends who have uh, joined. I'm very thankful for their advice and all their good work. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. If you have questions, well, well, I'm sorry. Will this event be um, up on on YouTube? Will you upload this the whole recording or no? I'm thinking to do that. Um, if this could be useful, then maybe I'll do that. Yes, especially for people who, who came late like me. I'm, I'm very ashamed. Nothing to be ashamed of. I, then I will make it available. Thank you. Very welcome. Okay, uh, I'm looking to see whether anyone else's questions, but I don't see any hands raised and I don't see anything in the chat. So I assume there are no more questions. And if this is so, I thank you all. And uh, I'll just recite one verse as a dedication of merit. Yadavattam maya punyam stuttvatvam stutibhajanam Nimitta bandhana petam bhuyate na kilam jagata. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, please use the website and uh, check it every now and then for new texts. Bye.